Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being so patient. Uh, a few technical issues with my Mac. Okay, um, today's talk is about uh, pricing for freelancers. Um, bear with me while I just. Okay, right. I'm going to cover a couple of things today. You'll notice. Anyone watch Family Guy? Yes. <laughs> Quite a bit of stewy, etc. here in this presentation. I'm going to look at some background and then I'm going to briefly look at three pricing models which I've used and I'm going to look at some of the benefits and some of the um, disbenefits, if that's a phrase, uh, for each pricing method. And I'm hopefully going to ex explain to you why I think value-based pricing offers greater scope for you as a freelancer or as a small business to increase your revenues and grow your business. There's some caveats. I'm not a business guru. I don't drive a big flash car. I make enough money, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a millionaire. What I am is I'm a, a Java or Java, a Joomla and Magento integrator or digital marketer. Um, I used to be a Java programmer. Um, I started freelancing back in 2003. Um, so I've gained some experience, I've made a lot of mistakes as I've gone along, and I don't think I've learned enough lessons. Making mistakes is fine, it's what you learn from is the important thing, and I'm still trying to make sure I learn stuff. And also your mileage may vary. Some of these things that I've tried that haven't worked for me, that could be because I'm an idiot. And I know you guys aren't idiots, so some of the stuff I've tried, you might have done it very successfully. Okay, so we're going to start with a story. Um, about four years ago, I was at a Joomla Day UK conference, my very first. I was a Joomla virgin. And um, as normally happens, some men took me to a bar and got me drunk. And we kind of had that discussion. How big's your budget? What's your average budget size? And it kind of... It, so we started talking about what's the average order value for your business? Is it this? Is it that? How can you charge this much? Or how, what, how do they pay that much? Or you're charging not enough. You're too cheap. And this is the conclusion I came to after talking to some of these guys. I said, guys, you're too cheap. And the average order value for some of these blokes was about £500 for a website or £1,500 for an e-commerce site. These um, conversions were done a week ago, so they're probably way out by now. And I was saying to these guys, well, surely if you're only charging, say, £1,500 for an e-commerce website, there must be other stuff that you charge, you know, the extras. And no, they are inclusive of all these things. And this reminded me of me when I first started out. You're keen to build a portfolio, you haven't quite got your pricing right. And one of the biggest mistakes I made when I started out as a freelancer is I didn't think of myself as a business. And you should do that. If you're a freelancer, you're actually a business and you need to bring some of the business disciplines to the way you operate. And the most basic business discipline is you should create a business plan. Every year, you should create yourself or write your own business plan. Now, mine is normally as simple as something like this. I set myself a target turnover. So this is how I measure, say, halfway through the year, whether it's been a good year or a bad year. What do I need to do to make it a better year? So as a minimum, as a freelancer, you should start out with a business plan. And this should be at least your, turn, your target turnover. I also set myself a bottom line, and this is my, God, I've got to go and get a job, bottom line. Okay, if I'm hovering around this level, um, or that's my projection after six months, I have to start thinking whether it's worth me carrying on doing this. And I've been there a couple of times since the crash, where you think, I would be better off having a proper nine-to-five job. So you need a way of measuring success, but you also need a bottom line so that you know whether you're not going to make it. And you should also remember that there are always costs involved when you run a business. 
even as a freelancer working out of your bedroom, you've got costs. And you have to be really aware of these costs because they really eat into your bottom line. And your average cost may be as high as 13,500 euros a year. Coming to something like this event is a business cost. It's not cheap. You need your insurance. You know what? There's loads and loads of costs involved in running a business. And that's even before you pay yourself a wage. So you have to be really mindful when you're going through the year about your targets, your, good, your target turnover and your bottom line turnover and your costs. And a lot of freelancers, particularly when they start out, they don't really have a, a good handle of where they are in terms of their turnover and costs. Of course, the reality is sometimes quite different. You have a business plan, and the reality can be very, very different. For example, if you have a turnover target of £50,000, you've got to turn around 30 projects a year. Now, as a freelancer, that's a real ask. I've never done 30 projects in a year. So if my average order value was £1,500, there's no way I was going to reach my target. Are there any Americans in the audience? Okay, you might find this shocking. <laughs> but in Europe, we tend to have something like four to seven weeks holiday a year. Yeah? And then we have the public holidays, which are another two weeks. And then we work on the basis, well... Most design agencies work on the basis you'll only act be earning money four days out of every five working days. And that's probably the same as a freelancer. One day a week you'll be doing your marketing, your accounts, attending conferences, training, etc., etc. And then you'll, you'll lose a week for illness. So you end up with an average working year of about 36 to 40 weeks a year. So again, if you're only charging £1,500 a year, you've got to turn out a project every week. And that's very difficult to do because clients are slow bringing stuff to you. They don't make sign-offs. So you might have all these projects lined up, but they very rarely run to plan. There's always slippage. So like I was saying, that's approximately a project a week. Again, I've never managed to do that. Has anyone ever managed that? turn out a project in a week <laughs> yeah so it's a major marketing effort and you'll end up spending all your time doing marketing if you want to turn over 30 projects a week rather than actually doing the work which provides for them so now let's have a look at that's the background so now let's have a look at how we might pitch for our work what our pricing strategies are well, when you start out, when I started out, the first and most obvious one is you pitch on price. You find out what the going rate is, and then you undercut it because you're new, you're keen, you want to build a portfolio. It's the easiest pricing method there is. Just find out what the competition are charging and undercut them or match them. You are, by default, competitive. Okay? It's a really good way of building a portfolio as well. Because when you're starting out, particularly if you're in a new town or you're, you've just started doing this, you don't, you don't know anyone, nobody knows you, so you need to build a portfolio quickly so that you can show on your website that you've done this project, you've done that project. And that's, an easy, well, that's the easiest way of building a portfolio, is to undercut the competition. Go in cheap. But it's got major disadvantages. The first is when you're pitching on price, you're really doing a fixed price. And therefore, you actually have all the risk. If the project overruns, if the client wants that little bit extra, you've given them a price and they'll expect you to stick to it. When you're uh, pricing solely on price, there's very little wriggle room. Cheap projects, in my experience, equal expensive clients. And... I've often ended up like Peter here. There's my client kicking the crap out of me. Because when someone comes to you based on price and price alone, they're not really interested in you and the value you offer. 
What they're interested in is how much they can get for as little as possible. So these are the clients who tend to say, oh yeah, uh, can you change the color here? Or can you add this little extra thing here? Or how about if we actually added that in? And when you say, oh, well, that's extra. Oh, no, no, clever guy like you. Only five minutes for your time, isn't it? That five minutes is basically saying they don't want to pay for it. So my experience is clients who are solely concerned about price actually tend to be the real pains in the butt. They're the guys who are never satisfied. Another problem with this is that if you're going to ship loads and loads of projects out all the time, quality is going to suffer because you have to do like a cutty, a cooker cutty approach. Um, use the same template. You just change the color scheme a little bit. And we've all seen companies who do this. There's a couple in my locality in England where I live. And you look at their portfolio and all the sites are the same. It's just a color scheme. But they're banging out cheap sites. There's another problem is we live in a, or an operate in a global environment. There is always someone cheaper. There's always some new kid who's just starting up. There's always somewhere across the globe who will do it cheaper than you. So when your USP is your price, it's very hard to actually do anything else but to go downwards. It's a downward spiral if you're not careful. And when I first started out, I competed on price, and this is what I end up being, a busy fool. Because you tend to have to take on loads and loads of work because your cash flow is, is low, you're not meeting your targets, so you take on another cheap job, and then you take on another cheap job because, for one reason or the other, you're just not earning enough. And then when the really good project comes along, you find you don't have time to do it because you're servicing all these cheap and nasty clients. So it's a really limiting for you as a business. Anyone, been, anyone here been to England and seen these two stores? Yeah. Pound land. Everything in there is a pound. Okay. Cheap and nasty. But how do you compete with pound land? Well, you, you, you open up a 99p store. And in England, you sometimes get the two of them together. And you think, oh, which one should I go in? Ooh. Now, which store do you think has been the most successful? Poundland. Poundland is just, is just buying out the 99p stores. And one of the reasons why the 99p store has been less successful is people couldn't be bothered to go in there and wait for the penny change. Yeah? So even at the low end, price isn't everything. Okay? So when you're thinking about how to price for jobs, don't assume that price is what's going to win you the job. And if you only compete on price, you're going to have a really hard life in, ahead of you. Okay, a second type of um, pricing strategy is what the Americans call cost plus. In England, we call it time and materials. It's a pretty classic for people who are selling their skill on a time basis. So, for example, a piano teacher or a builder. In the UK, a lot of builders, when they price up work, it's on a time and materials. How long will it take me to build that wall? How many bricks is it? There's your price. So it's a really simple pricing mechanism. Work out your hourly rate, times it by your estimated time, and then add something for contingency or profit. Like I say, it's a well-established pricing mechanism. Quite a lot of design agencies do this. They'll say, it will take five days to build that website. That's how much it's going to cost. Okay? It's got benefits. It's better in terms of in those jobs where there's an element of scope or a danger of scope creep. Because you've already added a little bit of extra, your contingency. You're not carrying the whole risk if the client keeps saying, no, 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 no I want this and I want that. You can turn around and say, well, originally that site would have taken us five days, but with these extras, it's seven days or something. So you've got a, the ability to cope with scope creep. It also allows for quality to be factored in. 
Because you say, okay, they might say it takes three days to build that website, but we take, say it takes five days because we're better. We produce a better outcome. You've also got that percentage of contingency or profit, which might be where you actually bring in the time and money to make the quality apply. Here's the most important bit. This kind of pricing allows for quality to be factored in, and that's what will begin to differentiate your business. Your portfolio will begin to look far better than those companies or <coughs> freelancers who merely compete on price. And it's quality that will allow you to grow a business rather than price. Like everything in life, there's downsides. The first is that it can be more process focused than outcome focused. Because when someone comes to you and says, I want this website, you're thinking in terms of how many days, how much effort it does it, is it involved to produce that result. So right from the outset, if you're not careful, you can be um, focused on what goes into the project rather than what comes out of the project, about how much time it takes rather than the quality of the outcome. Similarly, clients do like a fixed price. So you can end up in a situation where you are having an argument over the with the client about scope. Okay, you've factored in some leeway, but clients don't like it when you keep saying, well, that'll be another day, that'll be another day. Okay, so there is a disadvantage with this. Perhaps here's the most important limitation. When, you can, when you're using time and materials, part of your equation that goes into your pricing is what, what your daily rate is. You say a website takes five days, but you have, you'll have a notion of what your daily rate is. And that will in part be based on what the daily rate in your area is. Okay, So it's very hard for you to say double your daily rate without becoming uncompetitive with those people around you. As a freelancer as well, it's very hard to actually work longer and harder. There's a limit to how many hours a day you can do. So this can also be a limiting factor. You can outsource, bring in other people. There are ways around it. But if you want to stay as a, a solo freelancer, time and materials does have limits on how much extra revenue you can bring in. And then perhaps a more fundamental issue with Cost Plus is that what is it that you're actually selling? Cost Plus implies you're actually selling time rather than outcomes. So as a piano teacher, you are in effect selling time plus a bit of expertise, but mostly it's time and that's the way you price yourself. And if again, it's a similar situation if you're talking in terms of a website will take, say, five days, you're thinking in terms of how much time it is rather than the outputs. This is, um, when you first start out and you're based on price, that's what I would call an immature pricing model because you're a small company, you're not a mature company. This is kind of where you grow into as you develop as a freelancer. You tend to move away from strict pricing into time and materials. And a lot of companies and, and freelancers stop at this. This is their go-to pricing mechanism. However, there is something else called value-based pricing. <clears throat> and this is a much more mature uh, pricing model. It's uh, pricing your services on the value they represent to the client. It's not now about how long it takes you to build that. It's what is the value of what you build to the client. It's a subtle change, but it's important. Your price is now based on the output, not the input. So in other words, a website is a means to an end. So rather than focusing on how much time and effort is involved in building the website, the focus now is on what's the value of what you've produced for the client. So, for example, if the client says, 
uh, with this new website, say this new e-commerce store, we expect or hope or plan for revenues to increase by 100,000 euros a year. You now have got an idea of what that's worth to the client. Rather than, oh, it would take us six days to produce a website like that, you now think, okay, the client is worth 100,000 euros to the client. What would it cost us? How much would it cost us to produce a website that will produce that kind of value to the client? Okay, so if you think you can do it for 10,000 euros, the client is going to be quite happy because for every pound they've spent, they get another nine back. So it's a slightly different idea as you price it on the value of the output rather than what it takes. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, how does it work? Well, a bit like Brian. Brian's got a problem here. Okay. You've got to resolve how to, how to fix that problem. So you have to understand what your client's objectives and pains are. And again, it's an interesting thing is that often people come to you and they say, I want a new website. It's because their existing website is has been a problem. It might be that it's hard to manage. Um, it might be that it's not getting the sales leads. You have to talk with a client. You have to interview them. You have to find out what it is they're trying to achieve, what's holding them back, what it is they want to achieve, and then you can start thinking about how you can achieve that objective. And it, then once you understand what the client wants and needs, this gives you the basis to understand what the value of, of your solution is to that client. Like I was saying, whether it's a £100,000 extra turnover on a website, whether it's extra leads, or even whether it's making people's lives easier when they manage the content of their uh, website. That's got a monetary value. And you have to understand and try and work out what that monetary value is. And when you've, do, when you've done that, that's the basis for offering a, what we call a value-based solution. Okay, the benefits. Well, right from the outset, you're focused on what you're producing for the client, what the value, what the output is based for the client, rather than the inputs. Okay? So you're not selling time anymore, you're selling a solution that adds value to your client's business. If you're going to provide a valuable solution, quality has to be center stage. You have to front end the quality. When you're, when you're bidding on value, you're actually bidding on the quality of what the outcome is. Okay? And that's going to really help differentiate you from your competition because you're going to be uh, providing really valuable quality outcomes. Another benefit is that it acknowledges the value that we add. We're not just providing a website. We're providing a solution that will overcome either their pains or help them realize their goals. And when you're in this kind of situation, you're actually beginning to get the basis for a relationship, an ongoing relationship. So if you provide a website that, for example, leads to a £100,000 uplift in sales, that client is going to come back to you the next time when they want something done on their website because you've, prov you've proven you've added value to their business. And the great thing is they're not going to come back thinking about how much it costs. They're coming back thinking about how you're going to deliver again. So they're going to come back to you time and again when you develop this kind of output. But there are disadvantages and it's really, really hard. It's the hardest selling method of the three we've discussed. <coughs> You really need to do your homework on the client and the sector they're operating in. And sometimes it's not possible to do that. Someone phones up and says, I want a new website. How much? Don't tell them how much. Try and engage them in a conversation. Try and talk, get them to talk. Tell them you'll phone them back. Go and do some research on the sector. Go and find out what the company's worth, what their turnover is. Okay, then come back with the 
basis of a solution. So it's very hard to knock quotes out like that. It takes time, it takes effort. It takes a degree of experience as well. Secondly, you need a track record. That's really key when you're selling value-based pricing. It's so much easier if you can say, yes, we did similar for client X, and this is what we produced for them. If you can show a track record of results, then it's much easier to get the client to buy into this kind of approach. And because of that, it's much harder for a new company or someone who's just starting out to leap straight into value-based pricing because they presumably won't have the track record. And you need a degree of trust. And again, this can be very hard because you need to really probe the, the um, potential client about how they do business. You need to ask the kind of questions, for example, what's their turnover? What do they want to improve their turnover to be? that would be useful to a competitor. How do they work? How does their back-end systems work, for example? What are the integration points? If they don't trust you, it's very hard to then sell them a value-based price, like pricing offer. And on this question of trust is that now I ask people straight off, do you have a budget? And if they're reluctant to tell me a budget, I don't think that project's going to go ahead because they obviously don't trust me. They obviously think, if they say, oh, my budget is 10,000 euros, I'm going to charge them 9,999 euros. So they don't trust me as a solution provider right from the outset. So you have to try and find clients who are going to trust you, and that's very difficult, sometimes impossible. Right, this has been a very quick presentation. Has it gone too quickly? Okay. Right, conclusions. <clears throat> Competing on price alone limits you. It's very hard to grow a business when you're just when your USP is price. It's even harder to increase your prices when your USP is you're the cheapest in town. Okay. Focus on quality and expertise. These are the basis of value-based pricing. But more generally, these are the things which are much harder to outsource. Okay, It's much harder to go to the ends of the world to find these types of um, resources. They, are, they exist out there, but it's very much harder to commodify these kind of things. Value-based pricing, this is a bit of a philosophical point. Um, like I was saying earlier, we, we operate in a globalized economy. We're always being told that we are in competition with everyone around the world. There is a relentless drive to, dr to drive down costs. Value-based pricing is a way of kind of stepping aside. It's, try it's a way of saying, actually, what we do has value. We are valuable as freelancers, as small companies, as individuals, we add value, and that's valuable. We value ourselves. As Hazlitt said, he who undervalues himself is justly undervalued by others. In other words, if you don't value yourself, no one else will. And value-based pricing, by stepping away from a core pricing-only matrix, begins to offer you the scope to say, look, we've got value, what we do is valuable, we value ourselves and you should value us too. Well, thanks very much for, talk, uh, for listening. As Stewie says, I know you've stopped listening, so I'll stop talking. Thanks very much. Okay, the hard bit. Any questions? For me, some of, some of my clients insist that I'm not um, using them as reference of what some like channel or whatever. Yeah. So, um, how do you that? I've got, <laughs> th yeah. <laughs> I have three clients who are quite happy for other potential clients to phone them up. And that's my default now. Uh, I do a lot of work in the Magento space. 
and I've got, I think, yeah, it's three Magento clients who are my go-to references. And um, in fact, that happened the other day, and the guy came back and said, you know, they say you're brilliant. And I thought, right, okay, that's nice. There's another digit. Um, but no, so that's why you need a track record. You need a client reference. Um, a lot of the work I initially did was for other design agencies. They would get a Magento client in, for example, and then have no idea what to do with it because they'd never worked with Magento. So I would go in and I would wear their hat, if you like, and they're the type of people you can't use as a reference because they're not going to tell somebody else they don't have ex expertise in that field. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, you just have to try and find your own client uh, and treat them really nicely. It depends. Right. Yeah. It's one of the things I offer packages. So if they come to me, I say, okay, blah, 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 blah. This is what you get, and you take it away. If you want a longer-term relationship, we can offer support. Now, when I first started out, I used to do all the Joomla updates myself, never ask the client. They would get it. If they, if they phoned me up, can you put an extra an email uh, on my account? I'd say yes, please, because I was going the extra mile. I was uh, I was bending over backwards to help the client out, and what you realise is they just walk all over you when you bend over backwards. Um, so I tend to have now structured packages and make it very very clear from the outset that my preferred option is that they have a longer term relationship with me. So that's the idea of trying to build a relationship. And on some, I do actually operate partly on time and materials. I do retained work. So some clients buy a day or two a month of my time. And that is based on time and materials. It's very difficult to do value-based propositioning on that. You can do it. So I would try and sell them a, a structured support package. Um, what really annoys me is those clients who say, no, no, we don't need any training. No, no, because I offer training as well as part of the package. No, 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 we don't need training, thanks very much. And then three weeks later, they're saying, how do I do this? And you go, you haven't got a training pack, you haven't got a support package. Yeah, but surely it's only five minutes for someone like you to sort it out. Okay. Yeah, for that, uh, for, for, uh, for me, it's really work when I set a set, set, set of website as a solution. I get always a big point to get support package. So hmm. training, if it's a mirror, I come along, show you at your PC or yeah. working at all. Um, and I also say, this only comes as one-time offer while you, you, you get getting the sites. Mm -hmm. If you later on decided, it's can I do that? Yeah, I think that's a sensible one. Yeah, um, and quite often when I launch a site, I give a client a month to find bugs, and I tend to say well, what I tend to do is I I ask for a certain amount up front, a certain amount on delivery, and then I have a certain amount which gets paid at the end of the month of that month of bug testing and whatever. After that, they have to pay up, and then if there's another problem, well, that's then a change request, or it's a, under a, a service package. Just yeah. Because otherwise, you end up doing little favors for people, fixing little things. Which, which, which I have there, but you have to uh, establish a really, really uh, trustworthy relation with the, with the client is... Um, they just throw some tasks with you, you do it, and um, at the end of the month, you charge them for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you, you collect it all, and at the end of the month, they got a list. I did blah, 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 blah. took me about that time. Mm. That's it. I use a package called um, Free Agent, which is online accounting, uh, particularly good for freelancers, time management and billing and invoicing. And... Um, if a client phones me up and they don't have a support package, it's got a timer on them. And I start the timer and I say, you do realize my rate is X, Y, Z, and the clock is ticking. Because if they were to phone their solicitor or their accountant up, they do exactly the same. I've got friends who are solicitors and they have to do 50 billable minutes an hour. So they have to phone people up and say, right, start the clock and talk to their client and the clients are accepted because if you're going to get legal advice, you expect to pay for it. And similarly, if you're going to get technical advice about your website, you should expect to pay for it. 
Unfortunately, the internet is free, isn't it? Everything's free on the internet. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. What what sometimes really works? They can say, "Oh, I understand why you are doing this. Very good. If you do not find a solution, feel free to come back." Yeah. And sometimes it works because you know, they get ripped off. Uh, they do not have the solutions. Uh, and, 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 mm. and then yeah. I don't know. Two months later, I get a call. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, the thing is, not too long ago, I was doing some DIY at home and nailing a floorboard down, and of course, it went through a pipe. So I've got water everywhere going through the bedroom floor, etc. What am I going to do? Am I going to tape it up and hope it holds? I could try that. No, I'm on the end phone to a plumber. Yeah, it's a Sunday, and I know I'm going to have to pay for that. And I did pay dearly for it. But the option is, do I let my, my kitchen ceiling go through by taping it up, hoping it will hold, or do I get somebody who knows what they're doing to fix it? And I appreciate that the plumber knows what he's doing. I don't, so I have to pay for that. But like I say, the internet is free. One thing I have noticed, though, is that about four years ago, two or three clients came up to me for Magento work, and I was too expensive. And they went, no, 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 you're too expensive. We, we can get that cheaper in India. And they went and got it cheaper in India. Two of those clients have come back because both sites were screwed from the outset. And I've rebuilt one of the sites completely from scratch. So again, you get what you pay for. If you're giving stuff away, don't be surprised if it's crap. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much for being... Yeah, thank you.